and welcome to part five of our winter lecture series on pandemics. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as I know a lot of you, but my name is Richard Kelligan. I'm the library director here in Bedford. And I want to thank all the friends for all their hard work. And this is all their hard work makes sure we put on all these programs. And thank Elaine for the brownies. <laughs> Well, I uh, break the uh, ball. And thank you all for scraping the ball. We appreciate it. But uh, that's uh, pretty much all I want to say. I do want to remind people, though, that in the first weekend in April is the book, is the uh, Friends book sale, uh, April 4 to 7th. I know it does seem like a little time off, but it's going to get here pretty quickly. So uh, if we are looking forward to that, we good sale. Friends. Yeah. Yes, yes. And if you're not a member of the Friends, there are brochures on the table out there. You can join the Friends and help help make these things happen. Good, very good advice. Thank you, Beth. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mark. Today we're Professor Dan Brady. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, things just keep getting merrier and merrier. Uh, we began with a black death, and today we're going to talk about the greatest mortality event in human history, and that's the great flu pandemic of 1918 to early 1920 which probably killed at least 50 million people around the world, which is, in terms of raw numbers, the most people that have ever died from one single cause, this case, influenza, could have killed as much as 100 million. We'll never know. Uh, but probably at least 50 million would be a good estimate. Uh, and we call it a pandemic because this is an example of something with a, an outbreak at a certain place at a certain time that spread well beyond the place of the outbreak to encompass much of the world. So it's not something that's endemic and it's easy just always there. Uh, it's not something that's uh, relatively harmless. Uh, it's something that spread and that massively fatal effects wherever it went. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it was the case of influenza. That word influenza is a very old world in the history of this uh, old word in the history of disease. It probably comes from the idea of the influence of the stars upon our bodies, oh. sometimes causing illness, uh, influenza, del Astra. Uh, but however it came from, it's a very familiar term, and it describes uh, a kind of condition that's probably been around for about 6,000 years. The thing about influenza, though, is that the symptoms of the flu are pretty similar to the symptoms of other things that you might get. So it's difficult to actually say how many flu outbreaks there have been in human history. The CDC points to an outbreak in Europe of 1580 to be the first one where the symptoms were well reported and that really do look like what we would call the flu. There might have been about 15 outbreaks during the 19th century that public health authorities believe were the flu. But again, it's very difficult to say because the symptoms are so much in common with, with other conditions that you might have. Well, we're going to talk today about one big one, of course, uh, the epidemic, epidemic and pandemic of 1918. But I did want to point out, as you get to the first slide, that influenza is something that in various varieties don't just strike human beings, uh, that in fact there are different strains of influenza that originate in animals and sometimes can take very heavy tolls on animal populations. And one of those strains of influenza, something called EIV, began to cause horses around Toronto to get sick in 1872. And you began to notice it. Uh, these horses would begin to cough uncontrollably they lay down, they refused food, they couldn't work, began around Toronto, then quickly along the railroads, railroad horses would go, be shipped, this condition would spread, EIV. It uh, went into New York, went into most of the United States, and went into Boston by the late summer, fall of 1872. And that was something that had dreadful effects here, because when the Great Fire began in November of 1872 in Boston, there weren't enough horses healthy enough to pull the fire engines, and the consequence of that was the most destructive fire in our history. They just barely saved the old self meeting house, remember, on Washington Street, but almost the entire financial district went up in flames in the Great Boston Fire of 1872. Uh, this is at a time, remember, when almost everything depended upon horses. So in order to get food from the farms to the railroad, where you go to the ships uh, in, the, in the cities, you really needed horses, and now the horses were sick. How was the food going to get where it needed to go? Streetcars could not run in the major cities because there were no horses to pull them. It was a disaster, almost like it would be today, if the electrical grid could somehow fail all at once. Things just didn't happen for several weeks all over the United States. But one big good thing did come of this, 
and is illustrated here on the slide. 150,000 horses died in the United States because of this flu epidemic among horses. But what sometimes happened would be the owners of the streetcars would desperately want the horses to pull their streetcars so they could continue to make money. And even if a horse was sick, they would try to latch it up and start whipping it to try to make it pull the streetcar. Or if a horse was only recovering from the flu, they would put it back to work much too early. And the consequence was quite awful for these horses. One man in New York, what you see here actually in the top hat, his name was Henry Byrd decided to put a stop to it. And he got his friends together in 1872, and they went to every major intersection in Manhattan. And if a horse looked like it was having trouble pulling a streetcar, they would go out in the intersection, they would stop the streetcar, they would inspect the horse, and if the horse wasn't doing well, they would alert the police and have the horse put somewhere where the horse might recover. And that intervention by Mr. Byrd is credited as being one of the original events that would spark interest in civic laws about cruelty to animals, beginning in 1872. Luckily, the thing about that epidemic, as is true with most flu breakouts, is that it made a lot of horses sick. They were all close together in stables, of course, so this was gonna spread very quickly if one horse were to get this flu. But it didn't kill that many of them. It might have killed about 5% of the horses that came down with it. And that usually was, or something even less than that. And that's usually what we would expect of the flu. So that's the only silver lining besides Mr. Burr from this entire event. Yes? I just wondered whether it was transmissible to people. Uh, this one wasn't. Uh, however, the great flu pandemic of 1918 probably did originate in birds. Or maybe it could have been some other animal, but it was probably birds. And from there, it uh, went into human bodies and caused the terrible destruction that it did. So we'll get to that a little bit later. So that's 1872. Uh, as far as the flu was concerned, sometimes it was called influenza, but in the 19th century, if you go to the next slide, it was usually called the grip uh, or the grip. And if there was a breakout that people thought was bad enough to comment on, it would get in the newspapers and they would call it this or that grip. They would usually give it a name. And it's always been one of the pieces of bad luck for President Tyler in 1841 that he was president during an outbreak of the grip on the East Coast, so everybody called it the Tyler Grip. And for a long time, that's one of the ways he was remembered. Otherwise known as his accidents, he could recall, because he took over after William Henry Harrison died. But this had to do, this Parisian document here, with one of the largest of all the flu outbreaks that did spread around the world, and does qualify as a pandemic. And that was the great flu pandemic of 1889 to 1892 maybe the beginning of 1893. Uh, and this was a pretty bad one. And people who describe what this flu was like may be using descriptions that would sound familiar to you if you ever gotten a bad case of the flu. Uh, here's the way one woman described getting the flu during this outbreak. I felt as if I were beaten with clubs for about an hour and then plunged into a vat of ice. My teeth chattered like castanets and I consider myself lucky to have kept all of my tongue. It's pretty bad. The interesting thing about this outbreak in 1889 was not just that it spread all over the world, steamships and railroads were capable of doing that by then. It was also that a lot of people reported being unable to taste anything or smell anything. So a little unusual for the flu. And that's why some people think this might've been an early coronavirus. But we'll probably never know unless we get better samples of people that we can dig up and test. But for the time being, we'll call what everybody called it then, the grip or influenza. And a lot of people got it. 60% like of the people in St. Petersburg, Russia, came down with this, which is why it was sometimes called the Russian flu. And wherever it went, 40%, 50% of the people in the cities would come down with it. Uh, Prime Minister Salisbury in England was sick for about two weeks with this. The Tsar came down with the flu. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm came down with the flu. Didn't matter who you were, you were likely to get this. The good news was the death rate was not so bad maybe like one percent something like that no big deal as far as the death rate but among those who died if we go to the next slide was this guy uh, and that's the 28 year old son of the prince of wales uh, prince edward and alexandra that's the duke of clarence uh, always called any car by his parents he died in 1892 at the tail end of the progress of this russian flu and shortly after that guess what happened the murders that had captivated the attention of London in the East End all of a sudden stopped. <laughs> Which means that he's probably Jack the Ripper. 
<laughs> and when I try to illustrate the philosophical fallacy of uh, post hope ergo proper hope, I usually bring that up. Uh, murder stopped in 1892, Duke of Clarence died in 1892, therefore Duke of Clarence and Jack the River. It doesn't follow if you think about it for a moment. Uh, but actually, there are still people today who think he was Jack the River uh, after all this time. Anyway, to go to the next slide, uh, there are very few results of this outbreak. It bothered a lot of people, it was commented on. Of course, so many people were getting sick, you couldn't not comment on it. But there were no real lasting effects from this. One thing they could have done that they didn't do was make influenza a reportable health event. So if people start getting the flu, you'd have to report it, and public health authorities could then take steps to contain it. But they didn't do that. So could have been done, but it wasn't. And so we were not that well prepared when the next great flu outbreak came uh, beginning in 1918, as we'll see. But there was one big result of this flu pandemic from 1889, and we know there are a few lawyers in the room today, and they may recognize this. There were all sorts of cures for the flu that people began to peddle uh, after 1889. And one of them was the carbolic smoke bomb. So if you didn't want to get the flu, all you had to do was go down to the store in London, buy the carbolic smoke ball, breathe in the smoke, and you would be fine. And they would tell you in the ad, if you get the carbolic smoke ball and breathe in the smoke and you still get the flu, uh, we've got a thousand pounds we're willing to give to you. They went back to get the flu anyway after using our product. Well, of course, they didn't really mean to do that. This may have puffed. It's an ad. Nobody really means it. But this one lady did buy the carbolic smoke ball. She did get the flu. When she recovered, she went down there and said, I want my thousand pounds. And the winner gave it to her. She sued them, and that gave us the famous carbolic smoke ball case, which every first year law student reads in contracts class. And that case says if you are very specific about the terms you're offering in the ad, then it's an effect and offer uh, which you accept by buying the product. So it's a contract. So in any kind of advertisement, you don't want to be quite that specific. And because when you are, you're going to be bound by what you said. Uh, so that came from the flu pandemic of 1889. But it did abate, it did stop, and now we have to go a little bit less than uh, 20 years in the future, and we have to figure out how the great pandemic happened. And the easy answer to that is nobody is quite sure. But there were two leading theories about how that pandemic began uh, in early 1918. The first theory, which is growing in acceptance, although by no means earning majority support is the idea that it might have originated in China in 1917. We do know there was an outbreak of a respiratory illness in northern China in 1917. And it could be that people sick with that illness got on the trains this being 1917, left the major ports of China, went to Vancouver because they were going to be taken to the Western Front to work as laborers. And then got on the Canadian Railway and all the way to Halifax and then to Europe. And they may have, might have been the ones who spread what became the Great Flu. We don't know that, however. And probably even today, the major theory has to do with the United States as the place where the Great Pandemic began. Uh, so we have to remember that this is the time of World War I. Talked about an epic spreader event, the First World War, which would play a role in our story from beginning to last. And we begin our story in early 1918, after the United States had uh, embarked upon the greatest construction project in the history of the United States government before the interstate highways, and that is the creation of training camps for the soldiers all over the United States. 16 major training camps, to go to the next slide, among which, they all look like this, among which was a camp named after a man in the next slide, Oh, go next slide. Sorry, that's getting ahead of ourselves. Oh, I guess I, I guess we missed that slide. Well, there he is. All right. In 1917, everybody would have known who that was. Uh, he's a bit obscure today, but that is Frederick Funston. And so our uh, trivia question now is, what did he do? <laughs> he did well. I suppose he did. Uh, he was famous in 1917 because Frederick Funston was the man who captured Emiliano Aguinaldo during the Philippine insurrection. Uh, he led troops very well in the Philippines, very popular general, 
And this guy was supposed to be the man who commanded the American Expeditionary Force in Europe. He was going to get the command. But then in 1917, he was relaxing one day at the age of 51, listening to the Blue Daniel Waltz by Johann Strauss. And he turned to his wife and he said, isn't that beautiful, and died of a heart attack. <laughs> now, we've all known people who died visiting to the Blue Daniel Waltz, felt like a huge hole. Uh, it was very significant in the history because people wanted to commemorate poor General Funston, so they named one of the training camps after him. Uh, so Camp Funston, was established in 1917 outside of Fort Riley in eastern Kansas. And that's more or less where our story begins. Because what happened was anybody from the Great Plains who was going to join the U.S. Army uh, and then were conscripted a little later, they were going to come to Camp Funston. That was going to be a major training camp. So if we go through the slide where maybe we were before, yeah, there, we can go there for a second, just more or less of what they looked like, a lot of soldiers living close together. And the crucial event occurred off in western Kansas. Just as Camp Funston was getting into high gear, early 1918. Out in Haskell County, Kansas, for reasons we still don't fully understand, people began getting sick. This is a little agricultural county uh, way off in the western part of the state. And they began getting sick with the flu. And the newspapers didn't report too much about it because they didn't want to hurt morale. It was wartime. But if you read the local paper, you begin reading stories like this. Mrs. Eva Van Alstein is sick. Her little boy Roy is too, uh, is also sick, but he can get up now. Ralph Lindemann is still quite sick. Ralph McConnell has been sick all week. And the local infirmary began being filled. There was one doctor uh, in Haskell County, who was responsible for most of the people there, and his name was Lori Minor. Lori Minor now had about 10 times the patients he usually had, and he noticed that in this outbreak, which he thought looked like the flu, this one was more likely to attack the lungs pretty seriously, and he began to help patients die. And he wasn't used to that. Wasn't used to having patients die if they weren't already sick or didn't already have some serious condition. So he thought this was something new. He thought this was something to worry about. So Dr. Lori Miner got him a telegraph and he sent word to Washington. This might be something we need to worry about. This could be something new here in Haskell County. So that doctor, way out in Western Kansas, Lori Miner, was the very first health professional to begin reporting on an event that would eventually kill over 50 million people all around the world. And he did that in February of 1918. But that wasn't going to stop people from Western Kansas going to Camp Funston. They were joining up, the army was gathering, and sure enough, in March of 1918, things began to go wrong at Camp Funston. On March 11th, by the way, some of these barracks would have about 250 soldiers in them. So one person gets sick, they're all going to get sick. And as far as we know, the very first case at the camp was a cook. And his name was Albert Gitchell. And he reported to the infirmary after making the meal for everybody, of course, with symptoms. He wasn't feeling well, he had a fever, his back hurt, his head hurt. And that was about mid-morning on March 11th. By noon, within an hour and a half, a hundred more people had come in oh, to the infirmary. And they were sick. You go to the next slide. And pretty soon, they had to begin setting up makeshift infirmaries in any building they could find on the camp that wasn't already filled up because people began to drop. People began to sit with all manner of body aches, fever up to 103, 104 or so, uh, chills, throbbing headache, and about a fifth of them, they would begin describing symptoms akin to pneumonia. Uh, so the flu was producing something like a bacterial response in the lungs that would eventually uh, produce very serious pneumonia symptoms. And the doctors didn't know quite what to do besides isolate as many of them as they could in the big infirmaries, and the temporary infirmaries, they began setting up all over the camp. That was the bad news. You had well over a thousand people sick pretty quickly at Camp Funston. The good news was not many died. There were only 38 deaths at Camp Funston. Not great, but something they could live with. The nature of the flu, though, is it wasn't just going to stay there. 
The soldiers were going to leave the camp. They were going to go to other training camps. This was going to be, be spreading. And it soon did spread. If you go to the next slide, and it didn't help that the Boston Red Sox were conducting spring training very close to another military camp at the same time in March of 1918. In fact, they were going around the country, but especially in Arkansas, they set up camp uh, not too far from Fort Smith, and they played an exhibition game at Camp Pike, Arkansas, where soldiers were beginning to get the flu as well there in March of 1918. And one of the guys who got sick was Babe Ruth when he was playing for the Red Sox. And he had a terrible back ache. His fever was 104. But the worst symptom he had was a sore throat. He couldn't stand the sore throat. So what do you do with a sore throat? You give them silver nitrate. And they began dousing the throat with this chemical silver nitrate. And that almost killed him. Uh, he very nearly died. They had to pack his throat in ice to try to do something about it. And the Boston papers were all filled with this fear that Babe Ruth was going to die. Uh, but luckily, he survived. Meanwhile, though, the Red Sox, wherever they went in the South, they might have been responsible in part for spreading the disease in the upper South as they worked their way to the East during spring training. But it was probably soldiers moving from place to place that did it from camp to camp to camp. And we have the beginning now of the pandemic by the spring of 1918, as the soldiers spread it more or less wherever they went. Uh, not just in the United States, but also ultimately, as you go to the next slide, to France. And you can see, this is not going to be good for the flu. We've got these soldiers living very close together. And, and the thing about flu symptoms in the spring of 1918 was that if you've got soldiers who are coughing and sneezing, they're, are, they're clearly weak, that they're, they're sick, uh, you want to get them out of there, but, but you're going to put them in the rare areas that's going to spread both to civilian populations. And that's what began to happen in the spring of 1918. Now, one question a lot of people ask is, what was the effect of this, this growing flu pandemic in the spring of 1918 on World War I? Well, you won't be surprised to learn that General Ludendorff, who was very good at blaming anything on everybody but himself, blamed the failure of the great spring offensives of 1918 that the Germans launched on the flu. They called it Flanders fever, and almost a million soldiers came down with it. Uh, in early to mid-1918. Mm. It probably wasn't the flu that doomed the Germans. Uh, the British were getting it too. Uh, the, the French were getting the flu as well. They had a problem with it. Everybody did. It's probably a wash in terms of the flu. But there is a theory that later on, during the second outbreak of this, it may well be that the Germans, with very poor food supplies by then, may have been so weakened that their response was less effective to it than the Allies were. And that might have played a role in hastening the armistice of 1918, but we can't be sure. I, I don't think this had any decisive effect at all on the outcome of the war. But people were getting sick, and the question is, what was this? Well, nobody wanted to report too much on this that spring and summer because there was civilian morale to worry about. You don't want people picking up the paper and reading about their loved ones getting sick in the trenches. They're already worried, of course, about the war itself. So the Allies tended to downplay the effects of this. And anyway, not that many were dying from it. Uh, people were getting sick, they were laid low, but they weren't dying in, in terrible numbers. So it wasn't reported very often until travelers from France crossed the Pyrenees and spread it into Spain. And King Alfonso XIII got the flu in Spain as a spread throughout the civilian population there. And there was no censorship in Spain because they weren't at war. So the Spanish began reporting on the flu, and other papers picked that up, and of course they began calling it the Spanish flu. <laughs> but that's totally unfair. That had nothing to do with it. Uh, the flu didn't begin in Spain, but to this day, a lot of people think it began in Spain because it's called the Spanish flu. Don't listen to people uh, who say that. The villains probably are birds of Haskell County, Kansas. There's no use blaming them. Uh, but it certainly wasn't uh, the Spanish fault. The good news now is Almost as soon as it arrived, it seemed to go away. By July 1918, as American troops were going into battle in greater numbers, flu became less and less of a problem, and a lot of people more or less forgot about it. Boston was struck by the flu that spring, but only 51 died. It's not the sort of thing anybody would remember or comment on. And if that's all that happened, we have nothing to talk about today. But then, in August, of 1918, something happened that is still not fully explained. 
There were three courts around the world, all of them very important in the war, where all of a sudden the flu seemed to mutate. It began to strike people in much more serious, virulent ways. And the three ports were Freetown in West Africa, Brest in France, and Boston here in the United States. So we'll concentrate on Boston because that's, for Americans at least, the most important beginning of the worst of the flu. So we go to the next slide. Here's where it happened. So obviously this is a modern picture, but uh, that is by Commonwealth Pier and what is now the seaport. And in August of 1918, there was a big receiving vessel there where sailors in training for the Navy would go and be housed. Of course, Boston was a major uh, entrepot for things coming in and uh, lots of things going out. And the Navy had a big training facility there, and that's where many of the sailors were kept. August 29, 1918, sailors began reporting ill at the receiving ship. And this time, within three days, sometimes, people were dying. This time, this mutation was much more likely to proceed quickly to the lungs and cause pneumonia-like symptoms that would too often lead to death. Yes? Did the people who contracted the earlier way and had gotten the non-lethal flow, were they somewhat immune to the... The, the people who... The question is, uh, if you got the earlier flu, were you somehow more immune to this one? And the answer seems to be no. Uh, it doesn't seem to have been much of a difference because people got the original one and they got this one too. And that would be a tragic element of this. Uh, because what had happened is this virus, being a virus, although they didn't know that then, mutated very, very quickly. It became, became something much more destructive to human beings. That's why people began dying on Commonwealth Pier. And the Navy officials, the military officials in Boston were really worried about this. Where are we gonna put all these patients? They got them off the ship. They were taken to Chelsea Naval Hospital, the obvious place to go. That filled up almost right away. Now where are they gonna go? They began carting the sick out to Framingham at the old militia facility in Framingham. And when that filled up, if we go to the next slide, uh, by the way, they still have the World Series. Uh, this is now early September 1918, and the people in Boston were beginning to hear these reports of military uh, enlistees getting ill, and they tended to downplay the importance of it in the in the Globe and other civilian newspapers. There's no reason to think this is going to spread too much. All they would say is, if you have a boyfriend in the military, don't kiss them for a while. <laughs> so there's that advice in the newspaper, but but not a whole lot more than that. So they went ahead and they played the World Series as scheduled. Luckily, the season ended in Labor Day because of the war. So it didn't go any beyond that. Uh, but there were no civilians ill yet, the first week of September. So they played the World Series. They only did one rule change. Can anybody guess what it is? Uh, if you're going to play the World Series and you're worried about this flu outbreak now in Framingham in the receiving vessel of Chelsea Naval Hospital. What advice would you give to the people organizing the World Series? Don't play it at Fenway. That would be the best advice, but they played at Fenway. Uh, <laughs> but what they did for the first time in baseball history is they banned the spitball. Oh. Because that might not be such a good thing. Uh, just spit on the ball uh, during a game if, if you weren't about the flu. Uh, and they made it official in 1919. They, they finally made this, this spitball illegal. But that was the first time they did it. <laughs> but people weren't that worried. Civilians, still not that much effect. It's still the first week of September. Then we go to the next slide. But the military was worried, where are they going to put all the sick? And when there was no room in Framingham anymore, they went up to Summit Avenue in Brookline, all the way up to that beautiful park, Quarry Hill in Brookline. And the Massachusetts National Guard set up hundreds of tents for those who were sick. And that's Quarry Hill the way it was in 1918. Nurse probably doesn't seem to be wearing the, the face mask, hopefully. But they put that up in record time. It only took a day to put a, a tent infirmary up there in Brookline where they didn't think anybody was going to get sick because it's a big hill. There weren't that many people around. And they hoped for the best. But another place they put victims was Camp Devons out in Ayers, not too far away from here. And, of course, we know what the predictable result of that would be. On September 1st, Camp Devons 
one of the major training camps in World War One seemed to be a place where people were healthy. There were only 84 sick men in Camp Devon, so that was built for 45,000. There were only 84 sick. By September 10, there were 1,000 sick. And the numbers were growing more and more. And it was pretty soon, by the end of the second week in September, that Camp Devon was a disaster area. Hundreds were getting sick every day. Hundreds were dying. A total of 800 soldiers died at Camp Devon alone in the middle of September. And they had to stack the dead outside the tents like cordwood. Throughout the great pandemic, you would hear that phrase, the dead were stacked like cordwood. Because this was something that was attacking the lungs in serious, awful ways. They would uh, make sure the air sacs in the lungs filled up with water. You would drown internally often if you had a bad case. And this was not killing 1%. This was killing between 5 and 10% of those who were sick. And the authorities didn't know what to do about it aside from quarantine people as best they could and hope for the best. Well, you couldn't keep something like that out of the news. And eventually, Boston had to decide what to do because now this was spreading into the civilian population as it inevitably would do. Now we go to the next slide. Uh, here's an example of a doctor at Camp Devons and, and a nurse. Uh, this is probably a very bad case. But they didn't have enough beds to go around. You have people on the floors of the barracks sometimes during, during the worst of it, uh, which is why Camp Devons is often considered to be one of the most appropriate places if we're going to have a national memorial to the flu pandemic. Uh, maybe Camp Devons should be where it is. Can we go to the next slide? So what was causing this? Well, because this outbreak began in Boston, as far as we were concerned, a lot of people thought that maybe the Germans were seeding Boston Harbor with some sort of virulent agent. And that was a popular theory that began to go around as soon as the press began reporting on people dying of the flu at Camp Devons and other places. But another theory was the culprit would have to be bare aspirin, because bare aspirin was often prescribed to flu victims. And we know about bare aspirin, that was invented by the Germans. The patent ran out in 1917, but a lot of American companies were producing bare aspirin on the same formula, and maybe the Germans had found a way to make bad poisons. Uh, not such a bad theory. And the fact was that bare aspirin was killing people in 1918. But it wasn't because the Germans were poisoning people, it was because the doctors were prescribed 30 grams a day of bare aspirin, which is about eight times what you should be taking of aspirin, according to the way doctors think now. So it could be too much aspirin really could kill you uh, in 1918. Uh, but it certainly wasn't uh, the Germans who were doing it. But what it did was it presented a real problem for Boston. What was Boston going to do now? Civilians were getting sick. And the deaths were horrible to witness. These pneumonia symptoms that would cause people to draw internally were terrible. And what would often happen, because you would run out of air, the oxygen wasn't getting where it should be, what would often happen was your flesh would turn bluish black. Mm. A condition known as heliotrope cyanosis indicating that the patient probably didn't have much further to go. And that's why the flu was often called the Purple Death in 1918. Yes? I think the issue about the aspirin was if you take too much of it, it tends to build up fluid in your lungs. Ah, there you go. So yeah. it, it was one theory is that it was actually exasperating or even causing the pneumonia. So, and that was one of the reasons that the mortality was so high. Yeah, you know, it was doing the, the exact same thing that the flu would do. Right. Yeah, yeah. So. There, there probably was something to the theory that and, and, and you know it's contributing to the bacterial um, pneumonia infections. Well, yeah, sure. It's, it's easy to see how that would happen. So now they, they want you to take about four grams a day, but that's for not 30 grams, which is what they were describing back then. Well, anyway, now it's about September 20th or so in Boston, and by that time there's been a bunch of civilian cases. By that time, 300 were dead. And the civilian authorities had to figure out what to do. So now the question is, you've got this terrible event spreading from the military bases now, getting into the civilian population, what do you do about it? And the big problem that Bostonians had was the same problem cities around the United States would have a, a little later. And that was, there was a shortage of doctors and nurses. A lot of them were in France in 1918. And that of course made a terrible situation worse. And the nurses that were there in Boston, as around the country, as we would see, were all too likely to get sick. 23 nurses at Brigham and Women's Hospital came down with the flu in short order, mid to late September. 
And all across the country, 60% of American nurses got the flu, 60%. One nurse in Boston, by the end of September, said that she had 500 patients she was directly responsible for because there was this terrible nursing shortage. Yeah. So what were they to do? Well, luckily for Boston, we had somebody pretty good as public health commissioner. And that was a guy named Woodward. And in the third week of September, Woodward went to Mayor Peters and everybody else who caught in the bureaucracy. And he said, we need to stop the spread. We need to stop the spread. We've got to close the schools. We've got to close the saloons. We've got to close the theaters. This is getting serious. We've got to do something before it gets out of hand. And Mayor Peters thought about it, but not very long. Within hours, he had issued the order. As of September 27th, I think, uh, the schools of Boston were closed. All the theaters were closed. All the saloons were closed. They didn't close the businesses. They left that up to anybody who was in charge. But the meaningful places where people would gather were closed. And the churches were told, we want you to close too. That was voluntary. But most churches did close voluntarily. And the, the next Sunday, services were not held throughout the city of Boston among the Christian churches. So now there's no schools. And the teachers, who now didn't have to go to school, were encouraged to volunteer as nurses. And they got like a couple of days of training, and they went into wherever they had to go, and they did the best they could. The streets of Boston were all but deserted. The first week in October, it was a, a condition the like of which nobody would see until 2020. 3,500 Bostonians were dead by October 15th, most of them by pneumonia triggered by the flu. And just about then, the cases began to decline. Enough so that the city was reopened almost entirely by the fourth week in October. And you can see that the situation back then was very different than it was in 2020. There was no Zoom back then. There's no remote doing anything back then. And so if you want school at all, it's got to be in person. And that's why they were very, very willing to reopen maybe a bit more quickly than we would today. But the conditions were different. You can't blame them. And that's what they did. But what happened in Boston was all told a little over 4,000 died of the great flu in this beginning of the outbreak that was spread across the country here in Boston. It's not a bad death toll compared to other places. Boston authorities, I think, did pretty well at this in stopping the spread. And that example would be relied on by other cities across the country in 1918 and also finally in 2020. Here's really where it begins. I would say, though, uh, that Maybe it wasn't such a great idea to celebrate the end of World War One in great crowds in uh, the third week of November, because there was a third outbreak at the end of 1918, early 1919. But luckily, that wasn't as bad as this one. This one was the killer in the fall of 1918. So now the flu, uh, having been contained in Boston, could not, there, however, be stopped from spreading elsewhere. You couldn't do that. There were railroads of people moving around. And so the flu began to spread. If we go to the next slide. Uh, here's a, an example of a nurse in Boston. This is, from, this is a picture from 1918, doing the best she can. I'm not quite sure what she's doing there, uh, but I'm sure it's helpful. Let me go to the next slide. And uh, there wasn't a, a very large national response in Washington to this, uh, except advice. And what the Surgeon General said was, if you've got the flu, if you come down with this, stay home. Call your doctor, see what the doctor says, but don't go anywhere, just stay home and quarantine yourself. But probably not bad advice, you could do that. And one thing that did begin in 1918 was the first telehealth. Because people did call their doctors. Uh, and the doctor would tell them, here's my advice for you. That had never been done on a large scale before, but it was done in, in 1918. But only for a little while, because the switchboard operators got sick too. And pretty soon it was hard to call anything from the height of this epidemic. But this is where it began. Now, what would public authorities do? Well, from place to place, they advised wearing masks. And for the first time, you began to see a lot of people wearing masks in the fall of 1918. We don't know how effective they were. They weren't standardized masks like what we began to have in 2020 and 2021. These were do-it-yourself masks. And what public authorities would do is give you instructions about how to make a mask, gauze masks to put over your face. There's a big debate about whether they did any good, uh, but a lot of people did wear them. Uh, there was a lot of voluntary compliance uh, for mask wearing. And in San Francisco, Portland, other cities, there were mandatory mask ordinances in place. The first ones in American history, as a matter of fact. 
they would advise you to wash your hands frequently. Not bad advice. We still have still have to do that today. And from place to place, there were school closures, just as in Boston, and period closures. And for the most part, a lot of these public health authorities followed Boston's example and did pretty well. But I think a lot of you know the one big exception where they didn't do that well. And where's that? Philadelphia. All right, remember that? September of 1918, Boston trainees and the Navy, some of them ended up at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Navy personnel began to get sick from the flu, September 1918, soon spread to the civilian population. And when the first few cases began to spread in Philadelphia, the city authorities had a big decision. And the decision was, do we hold the big parade to encourage people to buy war bonds, the Liberty Loan Parade? Now, the Public Health Commissioner of Philadelphia was a different guy than Woodward in Boston. His name was Cruzman. And Woodward was a guy who thought about the worst case scenario. You've got to stop the spread because this could be really bad. Cruzman looked at the right side of things. Maybe this is a bad cold. Uh, we have to worry about it for a few days. Probably not a big deal. And so even though the U.S. government was no longer sending recruits to Camp Dix, right by Philadelphia, not too far away, because they're worried about the flu, Cruzan was not that worried. And he and the mayor of Philadelphia decided they were going to hold the parade. And from that day till this, authorities all across the world have condemned Cruzan and the mayor of Philadelphia for holding a big parade as civilian cases were beginning to spread in Philadelphia of this flu. But in their defense, they thought only 10,000 people were going to come out. Be a little parade, 10,000 people. Now we go to the next slide. Oh, the next one. There it is. So that's not 10,000 people, 200,000 people lying the streets of Philadelphia. 20, uh, 20 times what they thought it was going to be. All along Broad Street, there were these crowds, and every intersection, the speakers would stop and they would seek out war widows. And they would bring the war widows in the intersection and they would tell everybody, for your young men, for these poor bereft women, five bonds to support the war effort. It went on all afternoon, this parade. In the very next day, after the parade, a hundred Philadelphians reported to the hospital. Within three days of the parade, every single hospital bed in Philadelphia was filled. To go to the next slide, and within a week of the parade, temporary infirmaries had to be set up all over the city. It seemed at one time as if everybody in Philadelphia was coming down with the flu. Everybody available was enlisted as nurses. The students at Bryn Mawr College volunteered as nurses, given a couple of days training, sent into proverbially the trenches, but there were far too nurses and doctors to care for them. There were 1,000 unburied bodies in Philadelphia, as of the first week in October, it was so bad in Philadelphia that there were actually people pulling carts along the street, literally yelling, bring out your dead. As if this was the Middle Ages, bring out your dead. 17,000 died in Philadelphia. That's all, about four times the amount that died in Boston. And Philadelphia back then was probably the size of Boston. 17,000 died in Philadelphia the worst hit city in the country. And it's often said that if they'd only canceled that parade, it would have been a lot better. <clears throat> but from that day till this, when you talk about public health responses to epidemics like this, people talk about Boston as the good side, Philadelphia as the bad side. But the real good side, the real city that should be the example of what to do when this happens was St. Louis. Now, by the time things began to get bad in St. Louis, they had the Boston experience and the Philadelphia experience to learn by. And it turned out, early October, soldiers of the Jefferson Barracks began to get sick right outside of St. Louis. There was an election campaign going on, the midterm elections. Almost right away, the commandant at Jefferson Barracks did the right thing. He said, nobody can come on the base without a quarantine. Nobody on the base. But the guy running for Congress, a guy named Meeker, I thought this would make a good photo op to go to the military base. So Meeker went to the military base and he got the flu. And it was a really bad case. They put him in the hospital. They told him, you know, how to make it. And so I think on the last day of his life, he got married to his secretary. 
in the hospital. And he was one of three congressmen to die of the flu uh, in the 1918 epidemic. But in Philadelphia, in the St. Louis proper, the city of St. Louis, their public health commissioner was more like Woodward. And he was a guy named Starkloff. And he called a meeting right away. As soon as people got sick in Jefferson, he didn't wait around. As soon as people got sick in Jefferson Barracks, he called a meeting. And he said, we got to cancel the Liberty Loan Drive. So they canceled the Liberty Loan Drive in St. Louis right away. And they closed the schools. They closed the theaters. They closed the saloons. They didn't close the businesses. But what they did was they sent the police into the big department stores. And if you were a customer, they would move you around. They would buy what you need to get out. So they actually did that at the major stores in St. Louis. But even better than that, they had uh, every city employee they could find going into neighborhoods and asking who was sick, keeping track of the worst neighborhoods, the people who really, really needed help. And if you couldn't get away, you couldn't get to a hospital, you couldn't get to a temporary infirmary, they would find somebody to go visit you. So it was a really concerted major public health response that in St. Louis kept the death toll down to a minimum. And St. Louis would become the model for the next hundred years of what to do if you really want to stop the spread of an epidemic like this. The death toll in Philadelphia, I mean, and in St. Louis, was one eighth, one eighth of what it was in Philadelphia. Even though St. Louis back then was the largest city in Philadelphia, uh, only a one eighth of the bit in Philadelphia. Well, wherever the flu went, and it was beginning to kill people in great numbers, it represented not just a deadly threat, but a terrible disruption in life. Something that our generation is more familiar with than any other generation since 1918. But we can all relate to this now. Neighbors avoided neighbors. People were mistrustful, even petrified, uh, for weeks at a time in September, October, 1918. Before the pandemic, if somebody was sick in your neighborhood, you would go over there with a plate of food, or you might sit by them, ask if there was anything you could do. Now people erred on the side of staying home if they could. People who were ill all too often were left to their fate, but there was nobody to pick them up, nobody to help them. 675,000 Americans died of the flu, which is a percentage of the population worse than what happened with COVID, of course. And there were almost no winners out of any of this. It was, it was an event of misery and devastation that people for years never wanted to talk about. There was only one big winner, as far as I'm concerned, and if you go to the next slide, we can begin to see what it was. Oh, that's a, a painting by Edvard Hoop. That's what you look like during the flu pandemic, by the way. Um, but that would be interesting to see. But the, of course, it did spread all around the world, as we'll see in a second. Now we go to the next slide. Uh, has anybody ever seen this picture? Uh, so here's an example of baseball players wearing masks. And like I said, there were mask ordinances, although we don't know how much good they did. But Major League Baseball never had a mask for this because the season ended in September 1918 before the worst of the outbreak. But this is a, a picture you sometimes see. That's actually an exhibition game in Pasadena, California, where they had a little, little mask for this, and the baseball players had to wear a mask. Uh, and that's a site that would become uh, relatively common 100 years later. But this is the first time in an athletic event that people wore masks. Now we go to the next slide. And here's the winner, Kleenex. <laughs> Before the, the pandemic, everybody, of course, had a pocket handkerchief. Uh, and you were told, you know, don't sneeze and cough so other people can breathe in your germs. You want to sneeze and cough into your pocket handkerchief. So everybody had these pocket handkerchiefs, fabric, cloth, handkerchiefs. Some of them were monogrammed, so you'd wash them, you'd reuse them, of course, these things. But what they also feared was that if you coughed into it or you had some sort of horrible swell or something in your handkerchief, uh, Maybe for the time being, you would try to, you know, scrunch it up and conceal it, but the germs are going to stick around in the handkerchief, and the air is going to blow them around, so maybe somebody in the room or somebody nearby can breathe them in anyway. And handkerchiefs began to be considered unsanitary, not desirable, uh, during and after the pandemic. Into the breach steps Kleenex. So in 1924, Kimberly Clark came up with this product, uh, Kleenex. And the original purpose of Kleenex was to help women remove makeup. So you sit at your table, you remove makeup with a Kleenex. In the ads, we'll talk about how Helen Hayes uses this. So you want to be like Helen Hayes or Broadway stars, use Kleenex. I mean, that's what way it was in 1924. But then as the years went on, Kimberly Clark, in a masterful marketing campaign, 
began to realize that maybe there's another reason for people to buy Kleenex. And if you go to the next slide, they have to do with public health. So instead of having germs on your handkerchief that other people can breathe in as the air spreads the germs of the handkerchief to other people's noses, all you got to do is breathe uh, in, in to, to sneeze into the Kleenex, cough into the Kleenex, and then you just throw it away. The uh, Kleenex box, which you saw on the prior slide, actually had a patent to it. A guy named Andrew Olsen invented it. And Kleenex would say, you take two. Take two of the box at once. You can easily do it. And the thing that created by the Kleenex box, they said, you don't have to use two hands. But with other box, you got to hold the box out and pull something out. But the Kleenex box, you just pull it out with one hand. And two Kleenexes at a time, you uh, feed to them, you talk into them, and then you told them, wait, go to trying to get sick. Uh, and then the model that was smart for Kleenex was, don't put a cold in your pocket. Don't put a cold in your pocket. Put it in the waste paper basket. And uh, that way, you'll be doing your duty as a good uh, public health pioneer. And no wonder Kleenex sales took off all across the country as various minor flu outbreaks took place in ensuing years. They never looked back on this. And they had uh, this great marketing campaign that went on for about 20 years. Some of you may remember this, where if you could find out a new use for Kleenex, you would write them for the, with a new use, and they give you $5 to use it in an ad. They had hundreds of these new uses of Kleenex, but, but this is the one that really stuck. Uh, and they said, you need a Kleenex box in every room. So imagine how much Kleenex they sold. I think they did pretty well even during the Great Depression after this. But they're the only ones who did well uh, off of the pandemic. Uh, 675,000 died in the U.S. The uh, hardest hit communities were native communities out west. Uh, American Indians who had very little resistance at all to, to this particular strain. The uh, worst hit community we know of was outside of Nome, Alaska. There were 80 people living there, native people. 72 died of the flu. I think that's the highest percentage of any community in the world uh, was in Alaska. But all around the world, we think 50 million were dead by uh, the early 1919 or mid-1919 with the, uh, the concept of the third outbreak of this, which was an experiment uh, all across the world, which is why uh, some call this 1918 the worst year in human history, because that was the terrible year in World War I, yet the Red Terror in Russia, and you call this great flu pandemic, maybe the worst year in human history, depending how you look at it. Uh, the worst hit place in the world as far as sheer numbers, though, was India, because in India, you already had a crop shortage. You already had people weakened because of lack of food. You had a lot of people moving to the cities, hoping to find work to buy food if there was any available there. So you had a perfect storm when the, the virus hit India. We think about 18 million people died of the flu in India alone. And among those who got sick was Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi was laid low by the flu. Luckily, he recovered. But in terms of political consequences of the flu, there weren't that many. But one that you might be able to point to is that so many people were upset by the lack of any meaningful British health response to this pandemic in India that they began to listen ever more closely to the Congress Party, followers of Gandhi, when they talked about the need for independence. Whatever is happening here, independence can't be worse than what's happening now. So a lot more people began to join up uh, after 1919, after the pandemic. One of the only places in the world with no flu cases was St. Helena Island in the middle of the Atlantic. No flu cases there. Very few in the canal zone. Nobody knows why. You think there'd be a lot in the canal zone. People are coming and going all the time. Almost no cases in the canal zone. But to me, the most interesting contrast in terms of the flu, if you go to the next slide, well, uh, oh, uh, in terms of the effect on sports, they had to cancel the sixth game of the Stanley Cup because um, this was early 1919, a bunch of those players got sick of the flu and they couldn't finish the Stanley Cup. Uh, I bet you don't know this team. This is the Seattle Metropolitans and they had won the Stanley Cup, I think two years before. And they couldn't win the next, they couldn't win the, the Stanley Cup of 1919 because the sixth game was canceled, uh, unfortunately. And one of the players in the Montreal Canadiens who they were gonna play actually died of the flu. Uh, a guy named Joe Hall, I think. So now we go to the next slide. And here, this is the most interesting part of the whole story to me. And that's the experience in Samoa. So American Samoa in uh, 1918, 1919, and for many, 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 many years after that, was controlled by the U.S. Navy. And as soon as reports of the flu began to come in from the West Coast, the guy in charge of American Samoa quarantined the island. Say, nobody's coming in. But he didn't just do that. He talked with the native leaders. He talked with the headsmen, 
of the local Samoan community. And he said, this is why we got to close the island. Nobody can come in. And it wasn't just the Navy patrolling the harbor. The, the people of Samoa themselves, the Samoans, got in their fishing vessels, and they would go all around the island. And if anybody was trying to sneak in, they would prevent them. And there were literally no flu deaths on American Samoa. Contrast that, if you go to the next slide, with that place. And that is Western Samoa, controlled by New Zealand in 1918, in 1919. And the guy who was in charge of New Zealand Samoa didn't much like Samoans. He didn't have a quarantine at all. And when people began to get sick in Samoa, and they began to die in great numbers because they had little resistance to this, many kids whose parents were sick or whose parents were dead couldn't get food. But the guy who was in charge in New Zealand ruled Samoa wouldn't allow special food shipments into the schools so kids could get, kids could get food. He said those kids are too fat anyway. Oh. And in that part of Samoa, that island, the death rate was something like 20%. If we go to the next slide, what an example of the difference in public health policy. What a difference it makes. Uh, so there's Western Samoa, that's New Zealand, that's American Samoa. Uh, one place, nobody died. The other place, 20% of the population was lost. Mm -hmm. So if you ever need an example of what public health people can do, uh, that's an example to maybe cite. But to uh, conclude our presentation for today, the uh, great flu pandemic finally ran its course uh, in early 1919 after the third outbreak, which wasn't as bad as the second one. What happened, we think, was that that second outbreak, the really virulent one that killed most people in the pandemic, was a case of the virus not knowing its own interest. It was killing too many people at once. And viruses don't like to kill too many people at once. They like host to live on for a while until more could be created, more could be screwed up. So I think the, the virus mutated again to a less harmful form. And that meant perhaps that the, the, the survival prospects for it were a little bit better. But uh, the third outbreak wasn't as virulent as the second one. And uh, ultimately, it was a thing of the past all around the world by the end of 1919, but not before killing over 50 million people. Uh, during the midst of it, interestingly to me, they did their best to find a vaccine. The problem, of course, was they did not know anything about viruses in 1918. They barely knew viruses existed. And the assumption was this wasn't a virus, this was a bacterium. Because back during the Russian flu outbreak of 1889, a scientist in Germany had isolated a bacterium that he felt was associated with that Russian flu. So in 1918, what they assumed was this is the same bacterium, only it's now back and maybe even worse. And the bacterium was called Pfeiffer's bacillus. Right away in 1918, scientists tried to develop a vaccine, a serum, based upon Pfeiffer's bacillus. And they actually came up with something uh, pretty quickly. And they began experimenting. What they would do is they would help people who have the flu, that they knew about the flu, they would help those people uh, breathe in the mouths of people who were given a serum based upon fibrous bacillus that they felt might protect these people. And they had people with the flu literally cough in the faces, like, like two inches away, of people who had the fibrous bacillus bacterium vaccine given to them. And they would see if people got sick, but the results were inconclusive. There wasn't much of a sample size. And uh, they, they didn't really do very well in controlling for different factors that might not get you sick or might get you sick. So as of 1919, there was widespread dis dissatisfaction with the approach to this condition, this pandemic, in terms of developing a vaccine. It didn't seem to be working. So what they did, and this is, I think, one of the most significant results of the great pandemic, was in 1919, the American Public Health Association, dissatisfied with what had happened in developing a vaccine during the flu, came out with general guidelines about vaccine trials. And what they gave us were standards of informed consent, the need of a control group, which does not get the vaccine, the need to match controls by age and other factors to those getting the vaccine to see if it actually works. And those protocols largely were the same ones that governed the great vaccine trials of 2020 and 2021 that would eventually address the, the COVID outbreak. So we do all that, which was good, to what happened during the great pandemic. A few years later, during the 1930s, they did show that flu was caused by a virus, not a bacterium. That was a big major step in the right direction. And finally, to go to the next slide, by uh, 
you know, which I'll get to that in a second. Uh, by 2005, we finally knew exactly the virus that caused the great flu pandemic. And we owe a great debt of gratitude to the native communities of Alaska who allowed those who died, 72 out of 80 people in the one community, they allowed their ancestors to be dug up, to be studied, to see what was in their bodies. And they did that for all of us, for medical science. And the researchers found that the great flu pandemic was caused by an H1N1 type virus that probably came from birds. And we wouldn't know that if uh, the native peoples of Alaska hadn't allowed their ancestors to be dug up. So that's something we, we can all praise them for. Now, the only other thing I wanted to bring up was that when all this was over, one question that might arise was how do we remember this? Should we build a monument, statues to those who served during the pandemic, the nurses, the doctors? And of course, we didn't do that. People just wanted to forget this. It was a painful memory. And a lot of people just didn't want to talk about it. It so happened, though, this is one thing I talk about in this book I'm writing, is that the Art Commission of Boston was so worried that World War I would be commemorated in the same way that the Civil War was, that they held a great meeting of sculptors and public art commissioners from around the country in the city of Boston. And what they were worried about was, with World War I, we get a bunch of statues like this. They didn't want any more infantrymen statues that were boring. Every major town city had one of these statues of a standing infantry figure, something like that. We've all seen them. So let's avoid that. They had a big meeting. Let's not do that anymore. And so the result was, here's the next slide. They did it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they see these statues like this, Joe Boyd, all across the country. You've all seen them. Huh. Or they had boulders with the names of the dead, like in Bedford. Not bad, but it, it's something that didn't show that much creativity, which is a big disappointment to the art commission. But they, they never, during that meeting, they had this really big meeting. They never even brought up the question, how do we commemorate the flu? And we still haven't done it to this day, but we're beginning to. If you've been up, if you've been up to Fort Devens, there's a folder there with a, a long list of the events, of the steps that were taken to contain the virus at, at Camp Devens. Uh, and that was only put up a few years ago. To go to the next slide, New Zealand has put up this little monument in Auckland. Uh, 8,500 New Zealanders died in the pandemic. So there's beginning to be an attempt to commemorate the great flu pandemic. And it's taking steam because of COVID, right? reminding us about the sacrifice of public health workers and the suffering that people went through. And maybe it's time to commemorate what that generation went through. They didn't want to remember it themselves, but maybe we should remember them. And so that would be probably a good place to end. So, yes, go ahead. Well, every year when we get a flu shot, they try to decide what new uh, types of flu have arisen in the last year. Mm -hmm. So that means that this has been going on for 100 years. And I, I guess none of them have been all that bad. Not all that bad, no. Uh, because we know about viruses and about how to do vaccine trials and what to do, we were able to respond pretty quickly to the big 1968 outbreak, uh, sometimes called the Asian flu. And that's the one that Frank Borman got when he was on Apollo 8. So imagine being on Apollo 8 on the way to Moody got the flu. Uh, that's what happened. Two of the bank had died of that flu in 1968. Uh, so that was pretty bad in December of 1968, but they had a vaccine within a few months for that. So it very, very, very quickly. And some of you may know more about the flu vaccines, but they, I think it is as you described. They, they can use that knowledge in the basis of what these strains are. There's only two main strains of flu that humans get to respond to the mutation of the flu pretty quickly, but they never could have done that in 1980. That's right. Yes, go ahead. Um, percentage of Americans overseas died from the flu oh, as yeah. opposed to um, battle? Yeah, the, uh, the percentages are that uh, 45,000 Americans died in battle, which is really bad. If we were only in battle, for a few months in big way in France. So 45,000 dead in battle, a little over 60,000 of disease, but not all of that was the flu. So if you put everything together, I think it's something like 27,000 died of the flu, 45,000 of battle, and about 20,000 of other diseases. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, do you have any ideas of, of why the world sort of forgot the flu of 1918? I, I think the reason was that the memory was entirely one of sadness. Uh, people, new people who died, they had loved ones who died, 
they felt guilty that they weren't able to commemorate their passing properly. There was so much else going on. Whereas with World War I, the memory, at least in America, was one of victory and celebration and congratulation. So you have one memory where something terrible had happened associated with grief. Another memory where no matter how much grief you might have felt, it was all for a reason. It's all for something positive. And so one was largely forgotten and one was remembered, remembered. Yes, go ahead. Aren't there still across the world a couple of hundred thousand who die of the flu every year? Yeah, I don't know what the numbers are. That, that sounds about right. Yeah. Does anybody know the average flu season, how many die? Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't know that, but it's really more that they're uh, dying of pneumonia. Right. So, it's, yeah, it's not really, it's not the yeah. flu. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's influenza-like yeah. illnesses. So they're all basically jumbled together to pretend that it's the flu, but most of it isn't. Oh, and by the way, uh, I bet a lot of you have heard the uh, old assumption that the unusual thing about the great flu pandemic was it would strike healthy young men. So if, if you if you were healthy, you had no pre-existing condition, everything seemed fine, it's very unusual, and you would die of the flu, whereas before, typically people like that would easily survive the flu. And we don't think that's right. Uh, we think that probably is an incorrect assumption based upon the bodies we've been able to study. Uh, if, uh, if there's there's probably no special susceptibility of the flu to, to able-bodied people, but to probably kill people across the board, just as, as you might have expected. Yeah, go ahead. Apropos of what you were commenting about, would the current pneumonia vaccine help mitigate the flu, which then turns into limit the flu well, of pneumonia? One issue with all of this is your, your antibodies are your immunoglobulins, and, and there, there are many different types of immunoglobulins, and the ones that you want are the immunoglobulin A, the IgA series, because those are the ones that develop in your mucosal um, mm -hmm. membranes, and that's what would potentially stop you from catching it and, and transmitting it, but you don't develop IgA antibodies from shots in your arm. That's immunoglobulin G. And that's one of the reasons why flu shots don't work all that well. And there were so many breakthrough infections with a COVID shot, because you get them in your arm. They were never designed. Um, it, it's not what you do for a respiratory infection. Is there a better way to yeah. make break? Well the, well, the issue is always early treatment, which we didn't get, mm -hmm. because the the only thing you're allowed to consider was the vaccine that was going to be coming up. Yeah. Isn't the better way for the, the vaccine is to have a, a nasal spray that they've been working on, but they haven't perfected yet? And that way it would go into the mucosal membranes, the nasal spray vaccine. Right, I mean, it would have to be something like that. Yeah, yeah. but they haven't got that working yet. Yeah. Well, I, I think it was, um, but there's also vaccine shedding that happens in that case. Ah. Um, and, and there still is actually with the COVID shots also, but um, I think the shedding was one reason why it wasn't didn't become very popular. What does shedding mean? Hmm? What does shedding mean? Um, like you sneeze. That somebody in your proximity, either because you're breathing or you're sweating or you know something's being passed on. Um, I mean, there there are a lot of people who are unvaccinated for COVID. We're getting symptoms from just close proximity to people who were recently given COVID shots. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. No, no, it's not. It's the, it's the adverse events that they're getting. They're not getting any immunity, immunity from it. Oh, go ahead. There's another footnote for the Eskimos offering up they're dead to be examined forensically to determine that it was an H1N1 vaccine. Mm -hmm. It was quite complicated because the first set of doctors who traveled up to Alaska to get this done and found the group of Eskimos who were willing to do it, the bodies that they offered up at that cemetery were not buried low enough right. below the permafrost. Right. And the DNA was degraded far too much. And so they had to go back for a second try, if I remember this correctly. Right. Yeah. 
And it was a whole other effort to convince the people. And to the people's credit, they were compliant enough to let the doctors and scientists come back to dig up another set of bodies, which fortunately were found just enough to be below the freezing level of the carbon frost. It, it, was, it really was a triumph of, of science, the way they did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not too long ago, even 20 years ago. Yes, ma'am. What did you say the second strain was? What you said, I thought you said there were two. One was H1N1, and you, what's the other one? Oh, well, uh, it, it was this, this, the same one. I mean, it's just a, a slightly mutated version, okay. of it, but it's largely the same strain. Okay. Yeah. It's an H1N1 type. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my um, grandfather died of this, you know, the influenza and in Philadelphia or, or in Pennsylvania. And, and my mother was conceived before my father was born. Oh, so really? She never knew her father. So she oh. was born in 1919. Uh, 1919. So he must have gotten it after the Philadelphia. The big Philadelphia Good wave because she was born in August. Could well be. Yeah, people were dying in. December, January. Yeah, but and so I wonder how many other people have a story like that. I'm the direct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my father was born in 1904 mm -hmm. in uh, Minnesota or Wisconsin, and I asked him uh, during the '68 flu thing what it was like when he was growing up as a kid, because he would have been 14. Wow. Didn't remember a thing at all. He remembered the diphtheria outbreak where he was put in a diphtheria hospital. Yeah. And that was crystal clear in his mind. But this flu in 1918, neither he nor my mother remembered it, which, which is why I asked why it had gotten forgotten so easily. I mean, they were both teenagers, but it didn't make a big impact on them. Well, they were not in a dense population. That's less likely to catch you. That's an excellent point, yes. <laughs> And somewhat isolated on a farm. So that's excellent. Yeah, you might have been in better shape then. Yeah. 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 As a sidelight, yes. there was not just one flu vaccine. The only reason I know this is that I had the vaccine. I was allergic to it. So I could not have the flu shot for a number of years. And I went to an allergist. Was it obvious that our seven of them all with slightly different components mm -hmm. and they actually tested and found one that I could have? I see that I wasn't logic. And I thought, wow, how far have we come to be yeah. able to do that? Yes, it was last year. Yeah. No, no, hold up. During the research, drawing the right conclusions. Making sure money's going where it should. <laughs> and then the National Institute of Health was formed within a decade after the pandemic. I think it was the end of the 20s. They formed the NIH. That's another result of concern about public health of that arose. Good. Well, I think that brings us to an end of uh, this season series. So uh, thank you for making this possible to the friends and to Richard and especially to all of you for coming week after week. It's been great to see you again. And with any luck, we can all get together next time. Yes. Next year. Yeah. And soon we'll make sure that we head from library. Oh, yeah. And then we should have it back. Well,